Welcome everybody to another episode of the Gold Silver Bitcoin Show brought to you by the goldsilverbitcoin.com store. Please, if you uh, would like to, feel free to subscribe below. We are more than honored today to be sitting down with James Howard Kunstler. James Howard Kunstler is an author. He also paints. He also keeps a blog at kunstler.com. Thank you so much, James, for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be with you. Pleasure is all mine. So, you know, I think a lot of people are, they have war on their mind. They have Ukraine on their mind in particular. And you, you recently uh, kind of wrote a piece, No More Russian Dressing for You. We've seen boycotts of certain products. Sometimes in some cases, I, I saw a bunch of articles that people were, were uh, boycotting Stolichnaya. Stoli, the vodka and Stolichnaya. Stolichnaya. And then they had to uh, point out that they're actually from Latvia, which is not in Russia. And uh, yeah, let's punish Latvia instead. And then there's uh, also been, of course, these world changing sanctions levied on Russia. Biden just announced recently, uh, within the last hour or two or day, if you're watching this on YouTube that we will no longer purchase Russian oil. So no more Russian dressing for you. Can you kind of talk about what you were thinking as you penned that? Well, the, um, the whole way that the United States government is handling this thing is like a Three Stooges comedy. And just about, you know, just about everything that we do ends up being a two by four that ends up hitting us back in the head. And, um, my own personal view uh, of the situation is that Joe Biden could have um, uh, disposed of this problem very simply by making a public statement that Ukraine would not be invited into NATO. That was uh, basically uh, Russia's uh, main complaint. You know, they did not want to have uh, nuclear weapons or really any you know substantial weaponry based on Ukraine right on their border any more than we wanted to have uh, uh, missiles with nuclear warheads on Cuba in 1962. So it's kind of a, you know, a replay of the Cuban Missile Crisis in reverse. And um, it seems to me that this has happened because uh, the Joe Biden administration, and I, and I like to think of the Joe Biden administration, you know, Joe Biden in quotes, because we're not really sure that he's all there. And we certainly don't know exactly who's managing him. But uh, it seems to me that they wanted to have a war. And uh, they probably wanted to have a war to distract the nation from some of the uh, matters that are currently unraveling in the uh, COVID-19 story. And uh, it's become uh, something they want to run away from really quickly. So they've started this international, they, they've stirred up this international hornet's nest. And uh, uh, it's, I don't think it's working out well for us. It's going to blow back on us with uh, uh, problems with high commodity prices and oil prices and difficulties putting in our crops uh, on our uh, industrial farming mega farms. And uh, the price of food's going up and is going to go up more. And uh, ultimately, it will invite a tremendous amount of disorder into our own society, which is already politically disordered enough. Can you mentioned you, you wrote in, or can you discuss uh, after what you wrote in Don't Look Now, which is another recent blog that, quote, Ukraine is a manageable localized problem. Now it's obviously spun into something quite larger. And, and, and theoretically might have anyway, if Russia went into uh, the Western part of the Ukraine. However, I, as I am theorizing right now, there were opportunities for particularly Zelensky, I believe in this case, to make a statement that Ukraine would be neutral, even put it in writing as a way of uh, sparing lives. Now, of course, this doesn't have to be capitulation if you're thinking on a longer term time horizon, because perhaps in the future, you might ultimately get what you want from Zelensky's perspective, that is. However, that opportunity for keeping or maintaining the peace was not even publicly really considered, it seems, which then now has led us to this uh, 
from into an invasion into uh, Ukraine by Russia in order to maintain its security interests, as Putin has described, and also harsher demands, I think, also because it's been kind of escalated to this point as well. Now, you mentioned uh, everything we're doing kind of uh, being like a two by four coming back and hitting us in the face. Can you maybe like talk about what what was your view of the situation before war broke out and uh, perhaps from a strategic perspective, what might have been a, a more sane course in your view? Well, first, I have to say that uh, I saw a news item just minutes before we went on the air here that Zelensky claims to be uh, saying now that uh, Ukraine would remain neutral. That is not, well, he hasn't explicitly said that they would not seek to join uh, NATO, but that was the implication. Uh, if he's playing at cagey by failing to say that uh, explicitly he wouldn't join NATO, I don't think that's going to work out for him. He's, he's got to be explicit about it. Now, the situation uh, before the war was that Ukraine was operating uh, kind of as an international money laundering center, uh, including for many uh, American grifters, political grifters, including you know members of the uh, the Biden family. Uh, that's a well known story by now with Hunter Biden collecting uh, monthly uh, 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 salaries for sitting on a, the the board of Burisma Gas, and. Uh, the uh, a uh, associate of John Kerry's son being also a, another board member and with the Hillary Clinton Foundation that with the Clinton Foundation it's not just the Hillary Clinton Foundation the the Clinton Foundation uh, uh, starting to receive more money again uh, it was kind of uh, deactivated for a few years but now uh, Ukrainian money seems to be flowing into that and uh, you know other players who are getting, uh, and those are just the the American players. So Ukraine has basically been an international center for grift, and uh, you know some of that is stuff that has nothing to do with us, and some of it does. It's also functioning as a proxy for for us to simply you know punish and uh, and, and and persecute Russia. Uh, what, one of the things that uh, kind of uh, uh, interests and amuses and entertains me is the way everybody and his uncle blogging in, in America and writing uh, media columns in, Amer in America pretends to be able to get into uh, Mr. Putin's head. Uh, and you see that all the time when they say, well, Putin wants this and Putin wants that. And, uh, you know, to me, it, it, it's largely... Uh, kind of a, a fairy tale. We don't, we don't, we can't pretend to know what he wants, but I, I think we can, we can say what would be rationally in his nation's interest. And, you know, people like me are not, not necessarily speaking uh, as advocates of uh, Russia or trying to uh, side with Russia, We're just trying to recognize that there are rational reasons why they would behave the way that they do. And uh, uh, what, what seems to be the case is that our behavior is extremely irrational. So, uh, you know, the, all, all this business about calling Putin a madman and, and a psychopath is certainly not helping. And, uh, you know, as I said, if Joe Biden or, or, or one of our representatives like Secretary of State Blinken had come to the table and said, you know, uh, uh, we should probably agree that uh, it wouldn't be a good idea for Ukraine to enter NATO. That would have been an end to the whole business right there. Uh, you know, there are a few other things that uh, Russia appears to seek in its interest. Um, uh, they certainly wanted a cessation of the hostilities against the, the eastern regions called uh, Luhansk and uh, well, generally under the, the name of the Donbass region. And they wanted the uh, Ukrainians to stop shelling those people who are, you know, Russian speaking, uh, ethnically or culturally Russian. But, uh, uh, you know, we, we could have gone on to that and, and settled that too, but we didn't. So now probably what will happen is that uh, Russia will, uh, Ukraine, excuse me, will be, Ukraine will be partitioned uh, and the 
far eastern regions of Donbass will be, you know, cordoned off from the other part of Ukraine. And uh, we can hope that at some point Ukraine will be stabilized and uh, they can become a part of the world, you know, that's not going to uh, create a lot of mischief for the rest of the world anymore. That would be the best outcome. Uh, you know, I, I hear these uh, fantasies about Russia invading the Baltic states of Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia. And, and uh, some people are even fantasizing that they're going to go into Finland, Sweden, and Norway. And I find that completely crazy. Um, I don't see how it would be, interest, be in the interest of Russia to do any of that. Uh, for one thing, uh, I doubt that Russia needs any more uh, uh, new or, or you know, uh, these these were former Soviet republics, but I, I, I doubt that they want to um, uh, get them back under their control because they'd essentially be net losses. They'd be net liabilities. You know, they'd end up having to support them like wards of the state, certainly Ukraine. Uh, and um, I doubt that that's in their interest or that they see it in their interest. So anyway, that's that's sort of the big picture as I see it. Now, you know, I think we've seen two different lines of, uh, we've seen of many two lines of reasoning that come to mind in by the media. And one is that, for instance, Putin can't afford freedom and democracy on his border in Ukraine. I suppose, I guess that's now NATO's mission. And then also uh, European Union uh, admittance is probably what they're thinking, which according to many accounts was a long way out regardless, certain accounts. And then this other thing was uh, that, you know, Putin wants to put the Soviet Union back together. And that yeah. I think another line of reasoning that we've seen is uh, highlighted in an opinion article on MSNBC by an author, Zishan Alim, actually. So there's a couple of paragraphs in here that I think are, are interesting and I want to get your opinion on. So now... In, the, in 1990, the West led the Soviets to believe NATO would not expand further eastward across Europe in exchange for German reunification and the agreement that the new Germany would be a NATO member. This, according to Putin, was not put in writing. Most famously, U.S. Secretary of State James Baker once assured Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev that the NATO alliance would move, quote, not one inch eastward in exchange for this agreement. But as the late Princeton University scholar Stephen Cohen points out in 2018, that this pledge was in fact made multiple times by several countries, Western countries. So now I think that now in terms of international law, I'm not sure what, you know, the spoken word, what weight it holds legally speaking, but certainly if there is a clear history here of this pledge being made, I think it does hold probably more legal weight, but that's kind of an aside at this point. These assurances were not honored, and NATO has expanded eastward over the years to include more countries all the way up to Russia's borders. And so then there's a quote um, regarding George Kennan. George Kennan, the living legend who had fathered America's policy of containment against the Soviet Union, called NATO expansion, quote, a strategic blunder of potentially epic proportions. Thomas Friedman, America's most prominent foreign policy columnist, declared it the, quote, most ill-conceived project of the post-Cold War era. Daniel Patrick Moynihan, widely considered the most erudite member of the U.S. Senate, warned, quote, we have no idea what we're getting into. John Lewis Gaddis, the dean of America's Cold War historians, noted that, quote, historians normally so contentious are an uncharacteristic agreement with remarkably few exceptions. They see NATO enlargements as ill-conceived, ill-timed, and above all, ill-suited to the realities of the post-Cold War, post War world. And I will say that this network of alliances is something that has gotten us into extreme conflicts in the past, like World War I comes to mind. What are your thoughts on some of these ideas uh, that were highlighted in this opinion article? Well, I, they're self-evident for what they are. You know, it, we've known for 30 years that... Uh, uh, we, we had this disposition of uh, uh, relations between the, the, what was the Soviet Union and is now Russia and the nations of the West. And uh, in the meantime, in those 30 years, you know, uh, the United States has gone, gone out and, and uh, prosecuted uh, several 
wars against other countries in one way or another. And uh, uh, they haven't worked out very well for us. You know, the misadventure in Afghanistan was obviously terminated in a fiasco last fall. Uh, Iraq, uh, you know, hard to say that that was necessarily a, a, a victory for us or, or that it worked out really, really well. Um, Syria didn't work out well. Libya didn't work out well. Somalia hasn't worked out well. So, uh, you know, we go around smashing things up all over the world and uh, uh, under the rubric of bringing democracy to these places, it's become kind of laughable. And, and now, of course, uh, we're living in a country that is beginning to turn uh, the suppression of news and free speech into a thing. And we're going around lecturing other countries about uh, liberty and free speech. I, I'd say we got a lot of nerve doing that. Deglobalization, I suppose, in, in one respect, as we're seeing happen before our eyes, is betokening of worsening diplomatic relationships. It's it's a symptom of the sorts of things that you see escalate into um we've seen escalate into all types of conflict, including global conflict. So it's very concerning and uh We've seen the way in which I think it seems like the uh, Ukraine, the everyday Ukrainian was kind of forgotten in this, uh, in the run up to this. I think that certainly there comes a time in which diplomacy and all has to be exhausted. All, all efforts of diplomacy have to be exhausted. And at least publicly, I don't think we saw that come to pass. You mentioned Afghanistan, you know, looking back now at that time, you know, we see now what, in August or so? U.S. troops leave Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And now, I mean, are they being sent to Europe? And it just seems that uh, that this is now a one-two punch that certainly will be recorded in, in U.S. military history. And it'll be interesting to kind of see the dynamics play out as historians cover this stuff. Any thoughts? Well, I, I actually want to take this in a slightly different direction. And, uh, you know, I'm the author of uh, a number of books, and uh, one of them was my 2005 book, The Long Emergency. And that book was about the uh, probability of uh, industrial civilization reaching a, a very difficult passage uh, in the years ahead. And it kind of... Uh, 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 it, it kind of uh, works with the the similar idea of the fourth turning, you know, that you get into a, a kind of cyclical period of time in in the life of a civilization when uh, very disruptive things happen. And uh, it was largely posited. My book was lar largely posited on the uh, fossil fuel predicament that we were heading into at that time. And in fact, just a few years later, we had our, uh, you know, our first major 21st century oil crisis. I, I happen to have lived through the 20th century oil crisis uh, as a newspaper reporter. And I had a very vivid memory of how that all worked out. I, I was a, you know, I was a reporter in 1973 when the OPEC oil embargo happened. And I saw how uh, American suburban uh, civilization just froze and you know started to to unravel in a, in a period of weeks, and it made a big impression on me. And of course, the thing was sort of replayed in 1979 when the Iranian hostage incident occurred, and it was a slightly different oil crisis. It was more of a price jacking. But it's, it had many of the same uh, manifestations, you know, lines at the gas station, people fighting online, you know, et cetera. So I saw that before. And it's really quite remarkable that we hadn't had more oil crises since the 1970s. But by 2008, all of a sudden we were there. And, and this really had much more to do with the uh, uh, situation in the oil industry. And the fact that we were hitting certain walls of depletion, especially in conventional oil, and uh, we had, you know, we had 
We had peaked in production way back in 1970 at about 10 million barrels a day. And by 2008, we were, we were producing about 4.9 million barrels a day and using 20 million barrels a day. So we were importing like three quarters of our oil back in 2007, eight, nine. And that kind of, it's my belief that, that uh, these problems with the primary resource for running industrial civilization really was behind the, uh, the financial crash of 2008 and nine and more or less provoked it. Then we ramped up the shale oil miracle, which was a, an interesting thing. You know, fracking oil had been around for a long time, but we didn't really have to do it because we had a lot of conventional oil. Uh, the technique was, uh, at that time, uh, prior to uh, the 21st century, they, they used to do it with uh, uh, explosives, you know, nitroglycerin, uh, dynamite. They'd blow the rock up and, and uh, the, it would, the, it's impermeable rock and shale. The, the, in regular conventional oil, the, the oil can move through the rock because it's porous sandstone, but shale oil uh, traps the oil and it doesn't move around. So you got to blow up, blow up the rock and let the oil seep out. And that's what fracking is. So we ramped up the fracking project. And uh, your listeners might get a, a picture of how this, uh, how this works uh, and, and understand it better in the following way. The um, conventional oil uh, of the type that you'd get in Oklahoma in 1950, let's say, it cost $400,000 in today's money, today's rapidly inflating money, to drill one of those conventional wells. It would produce thousands of barrels a day for decades. And it was like a cash register. It was a great business uh, model. But shale oil cost between six to $12 million per well to drill. And it would produce maybe a couple of hundred barrels of oil a day for one year before uh, production fell off by 60%, uh, which was the typical profile for these shale wells. And then after three or four years, they're totally out. So, you know, you have to, the amount of drilling and fracking and the, the number of uh, truck trips with the, the, the fracking sand and the water that you have to bring to the arid places like the Permian Basin in West Texas, you know, this is tremendously expensive. And so the bottom line was, we did a heck of a lot of fracking and we, we produced a well of amount of oil and we surpassed the old 1970 peak uh, of 10 million barrels a day to 13 million barrels a day. And it was all kind of an illusion because even though we produced all this oil, the producers, the oil companies couldn't make a red cent producing shale oil. And, you know, they, they did this project because of the peculiarities of what was going on in finance, namely zero interest rate uh, policy. And, uh, you know, people couldn't get any yield off of the typical investments that they had been in for decades. And uh, they went searching for some kind of return on their investment. And shale oil attracted a lot of it with these glittering promises of, of great uh, revenues. But um, so, you know, all this, all this investment flowed into shale oil and the oil flowed out. And uh, America was very comfortable for, for a number of years because of that. But um, the trouble was they, after 10 years of proving that they couldn't make a dime uh, producing the oil, they're now in a situation where they can't attract new investment. Or, it's, or, or let's say it's much more difficult. And so they're not going to be able to repeat this, what was in effect a kind of a financial stunt. And that's the unfortunate predicament that we're in now. Shale oil, the whole shale oil uh, uh, endeavor is probably going to start uh, fading away. And, uh, you know, we're not going to get back to 13 million barrels a day. And... Uh, you know, probably in five years, we'll be done with that. And we'll be back in a, a pretty difficult situation with our fossil fuel supply. I can't help but first want to dive into like the parallels today, because we're seeing gas at $455 per barrel. Yeah, uh, we would have seen these issues. 
in any other sort of avenue of crisis. Can you kind of speak to like what your book, The Long Emergency, tell, teaches us about what we're experiencing right now in the oil markets? Well, it's sending us a very clear message. Uh, one is that uh, uh, history uh, uh, has a way of compelling you to adapt to new circumstances. And uh, it's very difficult for us to adapt because we're, we're kind of stuck in what I call the psychology of previous investment. We've put so much of our national treasure into setting up a way of life based on mass motoring that uh, we can't imagine letting go of it, but we probably will have to, you know, and, and uh, uh, we're, we're probably going to have to contract, make smaller and fine, finer and downscale most of the activities that are part of our economy. You know, uh, we're going to have to do everything on a finer, smaller and more local level. Uh, including things like, you know, industrial agriculture is going to get into trouble. We can see that already shaping up with uh, all the chatter around, uh, uh, you know, the, the sanctions uh, against Russia and the um, prospect of not getting fertilizers from them, which we need desperately. Um, uh, you know, we're going to have to, uh, this farming is going to have to be downscaled and it's probably going to require more human attention you know, with human workers rather than gigantic diesel powered machines. Um, these are realities we're facing. You know, the whole, the whole big box business model of uh, commerce is probably gonna have to go by the wayside and we're gonna have to return to far more distributed, regional, localized networks of uh, making things, uh, uh, distributing things and selling things. Um, you know, what that portends is really something like, uh, you know, Main Street's going to be the, the new mall. Um, shopping is, is not going to be the blue light special fiesta, the orgy that it's been in our lifetime, but it's going to, you know, fade into the background. People aren't going to buy as much and it's not going to be, you know, shopping is not going to be entertainment anymore. Um, uh, you know, we're going to have to find a way to get back to walkable communities. And that's going to be especially hard because we've flung all of our housing and all of our all of our commercial stuff all over the landscape, and uh, you know that that was actually the subject of uh, my first nonfiction book in 1993, which was called "The Geography of Nowhere," and it was about this fiasco of suburbia that we've invested in, and uh, what we might do about it, and. Uh, that 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 uh, uh, turned me turned me on to uh, and made me uh, an advocate of the new urbanism movement, which sprung up in the early '90s. And uh, their program was to advocate for uh, walkable communities and and uh, you know more compact living arrangements for Americans, and the, really essentially the return of the traditional town. Uh, traditional towns were places that people were happy in and uh, could function well in, and, you know, all classes of people could function well in that, not just, you know, wealthy people. And um, uh, they were places that people cared about. You know, that was a whole other dimension of the problem, which was we would created these thousands and thousands of places in America that weren't worth caring about and weren't worth living in. So, uh, uh, you know, that's sort of the nature of the predicament that we're in. We're going to have to downscale all our stuff. And, you know, I don't know if we can meet this challenge. Uh, I, what I think is uh, going to happen is we're going to resist it as much as possible and probably incur a lot of uh, 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 damage, disorder, and, and, and social uh, turmoil as a result. Briefly, I want a, a critique of compact living. So the, I think the one um, downside if one potential manifestation of a more compact way of living, you mentioned the return of town. So I don't think that my fear is what you're describing. You did mention also distributed living mm -hmm. is the city, I think is an issue. I think that just it's unsustainable. I think in order you better course, believe it. I'm just going to, let me just tell you what's, what's going on with that. Our cities have exceeded 
the plausible scale of their operation, their business model, and you can see it falling apart. Now, they're not all the same. They're, they have very different characteristics. You know, Houston is not the same as New York City. But, uh, you know, Houston is largely a suburban place and, and its failures will probably manifest as suburban failures. New York, on the other hand, is overburdened with skyscrapers, office towers. And what's going on in New York for the last two years and will probably continue is you've got these uh, hundreds of office towers that are going at 30% occupancy and that, you know, the business model for a skyscraper doesn't work at 30% occupancy. You know, you can't pay the taxes on the property. Uh, most of these uh, buildings, uh, commercial buildings are mortgaged. So that you got to pay a mortgage every month. Um, uh, you have to pay maintenance on them. And so the business model for the skyscraper is kind of broken. And New York's going to have a hard time contending with that. You know, Los Angeles has obviously has different problems. It's again, it's, you know, it's more of a suburban kind of organism than New York City is, you know, and then you see everything in between. You know, you, you know, Boston is more like New York. Uh, uh, you know, Atlanta is more like uh, Los Angeles, etc. And the net, the net effect of all this is that our cities are going to contract, they're going to get smaller, the process is going to be messy. There will be battles over who get, uh, gets to occupy the uh, uh, neighborhoods or quarters or districts that retain value, like the waterfronts or the, the old uh, historic cores. Um, it's going to be a, a terrible problem, and I don't think that we understand uh, how, how it's working. And um, there's going to be a fight to um, maintain the status quo, but it's going to be a losing battle. And already people are fleeing these cities, but they don't understand the larger dynamic, I don't think. Uh, uh, they certainly don't understand it because a lot of them are moving into suburbia, which is literally moving from the frying pan into the fire. But the action is going to be moving in America to the smaller towns that, you know, the, the existing towns that have the old bones of a traditional walkable community. And these places also have the additional advantage of being, uh, having a meaningful relationship with, with food production, farming. Uh, uh, not all regions of America are gonna be equally favorable for this, you know, but there, I think there are some things you can state pretty categorically that uh, um, uh, the, the, the regions around the inland waterway system that we have, the Ohio Valley, the River Valley, the Mississippi, Missouri, uh, 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 transport system is going to be a very, um, they will be very important places. Uh, and a lot of the places that are most distressed now in America, you know, in the Midwest, uh, are going to regain importance, because a lot of the, we're going to, the stuff that moves in America more and more is going to have to move on water. Um, the trucking industry is already falling apart. And it's going to fall apart even worse in the years ahead. And we're going to have to, you know, we're, we're going to have to make other arrangements. We should have gotten started on rebuilding the railroad system 30 years ago, but we, it was impossible to get any political support for it. The public wasn't interested in it and their political advocates were not interested in it. And so it never got advocated and it, it was never done. It was, you know, very little of that was done. Um, you know, one thing that's worth remembering is that our cities and towns are where they are because they occupy important sites uh, geographically. You know, Detroit is on this river between two great lakes, a very strategic location. Uh, New York is on this tremendous, uh, uh, this harbor of tremendous value. Uh, same with Boston. You know, there are some places that are not so strategically located. And I kind of wonder what will happen to them. You know, Denver it basically was formed around, uh, you know, railroad uh, centers. And, um, and then you have, you know, regional problems like the, the American Southwest, you know, uh, cities like Phoenix and Tucson, where they, they have very little prospect of being able to produce enough food to feed the people in them from, from that region. They're going to have problems with water. 
You know, I think that those places will be significantly depopulated. I think all the city is going to get smaller. Um, they'll all be, you know, depopulated to some extent. But, uh, you know, it, it's going to be a, a very, very difficult transition for, for us with that. And, uh, you know, I, I'd say that the American small town is going to be where it's at. You mentioned earlier that what the current oil crisis uh, is kind of teaching us, which is a precursor theoretically to a coming greater oil crisis, you've mentioned five years down the line, is that everything's kind of in flux and we have to uh, adapt. This reminds me of something that Heraclitus said, basically everything is in flux in the sense that yeah. quote, ev everything is always flowing in some respects. I think there's also another way of putting this something along the lines of like, you never step into the same river twice. Which it, now everything is in flux, which entails the coincidence of opposites interpreted as the view that, quote, every pair of contraries is somewhat co coinstantiated and every object coinstantiates at least one pair of contraries. Now, I don't want to go down that philosophical road too far. I do want to speak about how we as individuals and as civil society adapt to these changes and maintain, you mentioned disorder, maintain order, a semblance of order. Well, that's a really, uh, the most interesting part of it is, you know, one of the things I didn't anticipate in the long emergency was the extent to which the uh, public would just go crazy. And, uh, you know, we're living in a batshit crazy society now you know, that believes in just ridiculous things. And uh, I, I really underestimated that. I think that, you know, if you, um, if, if you have become interested in the new theory that uh, kind of stepped into the arena in, in 2020, uh, it was uh, Matthias Desmet was a, uh, is a psychology professor and statistician at uh, the University of Ghent in Belgium. And he's publishing a book about what he calls mass formation disorder. And uh, it's basically, you know, uh, an examination of how these periodic human hysterias in history work. And uh, that's exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing uh, one of those uh, uh, periodic hysterias that because there are so many people in the world and, and because of the complexity of our uh, economies and our societies now, you're seeing it you know, become the, the hysteria to beat all other hysterias. And um, it uh, is provoked by a few pretty simple things. You, you, you have a population of people who are feeling terribly disconnected and lonely and alienated and cut off. And that's certainly the case in America where you know, everybody's sort of stuck in their, their internet pod or their TV flat screen pod uh, or you know, looking at their phone all the time uh, and, and not experiencing any of the, you know, the, the universal age old transactions between human beings one-to-one -one in person. You know, one of the great lessons of our age is gonna be that the virtual is not an acceptable substitute for the authentic. We haven't learned that lesson yet. We're going to learn it. Um, the other condition is uh, that people feel a, an absence of meaning in their lives. You know, they, they have stupid bullshit jobs. Uh, they, you know, they, they, they can't make sense of what they're going through. Um, they, they don't make, they can't make sense of their personal future and are very, pessimistic about it. And so that, you know, that that's uh, another precursor of people uh, 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 kind of opting into a, a mass psychosis. And these uh, mass formations tend to find an object uh, for this anxiety to fixate upon, you know, and I think that we saw in our, in the last five years, we saw that that happen in sequence with First, all this anxiety fixating on Donald Trump as the great hobgoblin of, you know, of, of our time. And, and it's a very important part of the mass formation uh, dynamic that you need to fixate on something that you think you can defeat and get over. And you know, so the, the left, for instance, 
decided that uh, uh, Donald Trump could be defeated and uh, cast aside and let's do everything we can to, you know, to uh, uh, demonize him and get rid of him. And they did. They did it very effectively and they got rid of him and he's off stage. As soon as he steps off stage, you know, the new demon comes around, which is COVID-19 and the new hero comes into the picture to vanquish COVID-19. And these are the products from Moderna and Pfizer. And, uh, uh, you know, and exactly at the moment that we're beginning to experience the recognition that uh, these, uh, that this great heroic uh, thing didn't work and that so much information is emerging to show exactly how it didn't work, we find ourselves in the, uh, you know, in the middle of a geopolitical crisis with Russia and Ukraine, and with uh, Vladimir Putin being, you know, stepping on stage as the next hobgoblin that we have to vanquish. So, you know, the psycho psychological dynamics for this are really very rich and bizarre. And stooped in history, increasingly we're seeing that. For instance, the, the narratives around the Ukraine Russia conflict are essentially just uh, recycled from World War II. It, yeah, I really believe that. And then, furthermore, um, now <clears throat> these. Now, I want to talk about like. So you mentioned like, I what? How do we maintain order? You essentially said that like at the civil level, good luck. But how about as individuals? How about at the individual level? What tools do we need in order to adapt? Well, I think there are some very important considerations, especially for younger people. You know, I'm an old guy and younger people need to be very aware of what what parts of the country, what regions of the country and what types of places are favorable to plant their flag in. You know, uh, uh, they're not all equal. I'm sorry, we're not going to have geographical equity because uh, ge geography is not equitable. So uh, you have to decide, you know, uh, maybe I should leave Tucson and move to some town in the Great Lakes. You know, they have great uh, agricultural land there. They have all the fresh water they need. You know, it's very favorable for the future. And it happens to be one of the most disinvested regions of the country. So it has plenty of opportunities. Um, you know, young people, I think ought to look around in their, you know, the places they live and see the rich opportunities for doing the new kind of downscaled activities that we're going to need. We're going to need small farmers. We're going to need smaller commerce. We're going to need wholesalers. We're going to need networks of economic interdependence of the kind that we used to have in this country. It's got to be rebuilt, you know, or we're going to live in a kind of a savage, you know, human uh, uh, wilderness of uh, social wilderness. I don't think we want to go there into some Hobbesian nightmare. But uh, I, I'd add this that, you know, um, the way these things work in history is emergently, you know, according, according to the process of emergence, uh, which is to say that uh, societies are self-organizing uh, and um, uh, they, they organize according to what uh, circumstances and reality tells them to do at a certain time and place. So reality is telling us now, get ready to live more locally, get ready to try to build a local community and be a part of it, find a role in it. You know, one of the great things about the American town, uh, uh, the small town especially, was that um, people employed people they knew who lived near them. Uh, so that, you know, they, there were very uh, rich relationships between the people in, in our society. Um, people occupied two roles in their community, a social role and a commercial role or a business role um, or an economic role, let's call it. And, um, you know, these were rich networks of relationships, which are going to be uh, they're going to take a lot of rebuilding. And in doing that, we're going to reconnect people with each other. Human life is not going to be, uh, it's not going to be nirvana. You know, we, you know, we had wars and conflicts and disagreements and depressions and all kinds of problems, even well, even when America was a well-organized place on the landscape. 
but still, it, you know, uh, uh, we're not going to be able to go forward with the disposition of things that we find ourselves in today. We're going to have to we're going to have to fix it and uh, and and go to a uh, a newer and better disposition. I wouldn't call it a great reset. I'm not part of that movement. But, you know, it, it, it'll be, uh, you know, as you say, history is a flux and things are constantly changing and responding to the the mandates of reality. What do you think a good sized town is or good size is? Well, um, that's a very good question. You know, I, uh, it's hard to say, you know, with any kind of accuracy, uh, how that's going to work. I, I've lived, I grew up in Manhattan. So, you know, I'm quite experienced with uh, the mega city. And um, I actually reacted to it. And I've spent most of my adult life in in smaller places. And uh, I moved to Saratoga Springs, New York in 1975, when I dropped out of corporate journalism. And uh, I've lived in the region ever since, uh, although I moved into a town that's, uh, that's now out, you know, I'm, I'm 15 miles east of Saratoga. Now I lived in Saratoga for 20, 28 or 30 years, something like that. And uh, its population is about 29,000. Uh, it's uh, a very sturdy Main Street town with uh, a very diverse economy. Um, it'll probably go through, so, you know, the, many of the same travails that the rest of America goes through in this period of upheaval. But, it, you know, it has survived. Many of the other towns in my region, which is the upper Hudson Valley, are really uh, uh, beat, really badly beat, including the little factory village that I moved to in uh in 2012 i moved out here because i wanted to have a little homestead with uh gardens and fruit trees and uh, chickens and i found a property that was literally on the edge of town i'm 11 feet outside the tax district and i can walk to main street in eight minutes so uh you know i didn't want to be marooned out uh, you know out in the boonies so uh um my town is very beat you know, the only the stores on our main street, and there are many shop fronts on it, you know, some of them vacant. Uh, the only stores that are still operating sell other people's old shit, right? Consignment shops. But that's going to change. You know, the, uh, you know, the chain stores are going to lose their mojo. Uh, their business model will fail too. Uh, it might even be happening now as we enter this supply chain crisis. And we're going to have to find other ways to reorganize. And um, you know, you can see right now uh, what what may be two factors in that. Uh, uh, for for example, you know, we're having problems with uh, the withering of the global economy and and the uh, obstructions in supply chain chains, and that's combining with the high cost of gas, which is going to you know traumatize people and freak them out, and. Uh, make them start thinking a little bit about living in a place where they don't have to get in their car all the time to do stuff. And I think a lot of that will provoke the return of our main street. Uh, you know, that, that'll be the uh, eventuality of that. So, um, uh, you know, you can see how these these swirling, the swirling flux of dynamics is tending towards, you know, certain outcomes. I suppose, as you mentioned, society is self-organizing, and I guess, uh, according to certain theories, it's individuals, first and foremost, who end up uh, kind of being the drivers of that organization, as opposed to like some top-down decrees, for instance. So we'll see yeah. evolve uh, what, kind of, uh, what kind of towns make sense. I imagine it'll be based on numerous factors. It'll be based on uh, the geography of that specific town, how arid or, or otherwise the lands are around them, what can be produced on the land around them. And then also, what its transportation uh, 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 probabilities are. So, you for know, instance, move, move stuff. You you don't maybe want to be in the thick of the Rockies, for instance. Right. And then yeah, uh, very 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 uh, short growing season out, out there in Montana. You know, a lot of people moved out to uh, Montana and Idaho. You know, there are microclimates in in those places that, especially in Idaho, that are uh, a little more favorable. But uh, for the most part, you know, they're going to have trouble growing stuff out there.
Interestingly, I think uh, there's also, uh, and I wanted to mention this too, so I'm glad you brought it up, uh, Montana, Idaho. I moved from California to Idaho recently. There's a place called Lewiston in the Panhandle, and it's the it's the uh, furthest east port on the Pacific Ocean. So there's mm-hmm. a river. and there's it has, a Snake River? I, I, I believe Snake, Snake River. I'm not sure. I believe actually that Snake collects, River. That connects to the Columbia. I believe it has a different name west of Lewiston. So I, I'm not sure which rivers they are, but they're big enough to where they're able to get boats there and shipments. So that port being there might be a strategic advantage for Lewiston, yeah. for instance. Now, I'm curious, growing seasons, where do you have any microclimates off the top of your head uh, in this region, uh, in the inner mountain west, uh, which are beneficial for growing? I, I'm not really an expert about that. So, you know, I I, I won't really go there. I mean, I, I know that, South. you know, it's probably it's in, it's in the south where there's, for instance, sun. This is something else that people are going to uh, really need to consider. Now, I know that the area around Spokane, for example, well, that's over in Washington State, but sort of on the border of Idaho. You know that that's a very rich agricultural region, and uh, you know obviously they grow a lot of potatoes in Idaho, and uh, you know the, the, there's there, there's quite a bit of potential there if everybody from Los Angeles doesn't move there tomorrow. So I, where I am in the panhandle, in the Western panhandle, there is in Coeur d'Alene, there is actually a Pacific influence. So we're not only continental weather, we get some Pacific influence, which I think is quite nice on certain nights, days, for instance, sure. anything else before we wrap up, James, that you want people to know, like where you can find your work, anything that's coming up? Yeah, well, um, uh, I publish a uh, twice a week blog on Monday and Friday and not the days in between. Uh, it's called Clusterfuck Nation. It's usually pretty amusing. Um, and uh, it's at uh, www.kunstler.com, K U N S T L E R.com. Uh, my books are, you know, all over the, the website, so they're, they're easy to find. And, um, you know, I, I especially wish young people good luck. It's, you know, it's very important for them to think about where they're going to live and what they might do in the place that they want to live in. And, it, you know, uh, there are so many young people who are kind of uh, mind fucked into thinking that they have to go to college. And I think that that is very quickly becoming a thing of the past. And they would be well advised to consider some alternative route to a career or a vocation and something especially that they find meaningful. I, su- I, suspo- I suppose there are certain instances and when you do want to go to a to university and college, but if that if, sure, you're, sure. if you're pursuing one of those fields, be very scrupulous in picking where you go. It, there's so many factors to consider, not least of which how much money you have to put out. Well, also not going. least of which, you know, we're, we're witnessing what will probably be the first wave of the collapse of the higher ed in America, uh, by which I mean a lot of colleges are going to fail, you know, uh, and the big ones are going to get into a, a lot of trouble financially. Um, so that, you know, that is a process that's underway just as the collapse of the medical industry is underway. Uh, the medical industry, especially because they've spent uh, the last two years, um, uh, uh, behaving really badly, let's say. Let's say, great. Well, we've had the honor and privilege of sitting down today with James Howard Kunstler. He's the author of many books. You can look at the books at kunstler.com. They include, uh, as you mentioned, the- The Long Emergency, The yes. Geography of Nowhere, Home from Nowhere, The City in Mind, uh, my 2000. 2000- uh, 12 book, Too Much Magic, which is about wishful thinking and technology, something that we really have to pay attention to, because we're not going to be zipping around in a 200, 200 million vehicle fleet of electric cars. That ain't going to happen. So uh, yeah, be very wary of wishful thinking. Too Much Magic. Thank you so much, James, for joining us today. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Nice to be here. Pleasure's all mine.